Welcome to Hoxton Square. We are back round the kitchen table at this little publishing house in East London for more talk about forgotten books and publishing. Now this, of course, is a literary magazine and you will hear the editorial team getting on with their work round us. It's a bright office with big windows and we record in here because... Essentially, it's way more fun uh, than being in a gloomy studio and also because we like to think you enjoy hearing all the comings and goings too. Now, if you heard last month's podcast, you'll know we talked about garden writing and this time we've gone for a seasonal theme and we're going to discuss the burgeoning industry of literary festivals. Fox editor Gail Perkis is here along with her colleague Stephanie Allen and my name is Philippa Lamb. Uh, Gail, I know you and your fellow editor, Hazel, you often speak at festivals, don't you? We, we do a couple of times a year, um, and we've done big ones um, like Oxford, which was rather terrifying. Uh, and we do um, small ones as well. And last year we did Wells Next to Sea, uh, where there's a festival called Sea Fever. And we're generally talking about how we started Slightly Foxed. And we've come to enjoy them. To begin with, it was rather frightening. Was, was it the audience that was making you feel uneasy about doing it? Or? No, just the terror of public speaking, okay. that's all. Okay. But once we got over that, a lot of subscribers come to the festivals and it's very nice to meet people who we know their names or we may have spoken to them on the phone of occasionally. Course, but, yeah. So, yeah, they're, they're fun to do. And do you go to festivals, I mean, literary festivals, as a consumer, as it were? I have to admit, I don't often, partly because it's a busman's holiday, what about you, Steph? Yes, I'm quite keen on festivals. In our previous life, when we worked at John Murray's, I often used to book authors into festivals and then I'd go along with them. So I've experienced quite a lot. Um, Dartington, which was wonderful, uh, Ways with Words and lots of small festivals. There are around 350 literary festivals in the UK now. And I think it's, it's fun to go along and experience them. You don't have to go for the whole festival, but just go for a couple of events yeah, well, we have two festival organisers joining us in a bit, but uh, before we get to that, let's have a quick update on, on what's happening here with the magazine and the books. Um, well, the printers are extremely busy because we've I've just sent off uh, the next issue, which comes out at the beginning of September, uh, the next Slightly Fox edition, which is Roald Dahl's um, childhood memoir, Boy, and the first two volumes of Rosemary Sutcliffe's Eagle of the Ninth series. And we're also reissuing Corduroy by Adrian Bell in a hardback. And we've just bought the most enormous quantity of 10 tonnes of paper. So Ten tons. that arrived at the printers and a very large invoice also arrived. <laughs> but it's made specially. Oh, I see. So that's why you have to buy it in such huge exactly. quantity. Exactly. Yes, yes. And it always makes my heart sink because it doesn't do the cash flow much good. But No. We did talk about the ins and outs of the paper and the covers and things in a previous one. We did. In the series, we did. And it's a whole thing. I hadn't understood what it was about choosing paper and getting it manufactured. Given this is slightly foxed, I'm assuming it comes from... It comes from an English mill, yes. Now, before we move on, dog-related questions. I was talking to you and Steph earlier. Vet visit again? Yes, Giddy had uh, a grass seed caught in his paw. Well, they're here today, so we may hear more from them uh, during the course of the podcast. So, Steph, and we've, there's events, aren't there, we need to tell there people about? There are two events coming up in September. Gail and Hazel are talking at the Festival of Book Clubs, which takes place in Highfield House Hotel in Hook in Hampshire. I won't give any more details because it's actually sold out. They have a mix of authors and journalists and obviously magazines there during the day. That sounds great. Is it every year? Yes, yes. And they have local book groups coming along. They all take a table, they have lunch, and then they listen to speakers in the afternoon. So if you belong to a book group, could you take part? A local book group, yes, you could. Yes, okay. yes. The following day... We are launching our autumn issue and new edition at One Tree Books in Petersfield. Anybody who lives anywhere near Petersfield could come along 10th of September, 6.30pm for a glass of wine and to meet the team. Details on the website? Details will be on the website, yes. Now this month's guests are Anne Oxborough, Director of Ways of With Words, which we were just talking about, which started in Devon in the southwest of England, and Michael Pugh of Langham Literary Festival in West Wales. The reading we've chosen from the archive this time uh, is from A.F. Harold's piece on his experience of speed dating while assuming the character of Iris Murdoch. And I promise you all will become clearer when you hear it. Uh, everyone will have book recommendations for you later on. Uh, but first, Anne and Michael, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. 
So, Anne, tell us a little bit about um, the roots of Ways with Words, because uh, it's a very famous festival. Yes, it began um, some 28 years ago in Dartington, Devon. Kay Dunbar and Stephen Bristow began it with the idea of a literary festival of words and ideas that would be as inclusive as possible, as much breadth as possible in it. We actually lived at Dartington itself, which, for those that know it, is an absolutely beautiful estate in South Devon. Um, so has a quite gorgeous a, part of the country. Absolutely gorgeous. And Dartington itself has quite a history of experimentation in arts and culture, so it's a perfect place really to begin it. Since then, we've spread out. We have a festival in March in Cumbria, in Keswick, at the Theatre by the Lake, another extremely beautiful part of the world, and Southwold in Suffolk. On the seaside? Yes, a smaller event, because the other two are 10-day events, but that one's a a four- or five-day event in November. We're recording this in July, and actually you have one kicking off this Friday. Yes, at Dartington. It's quite a big event. We've got two venues at Dartington. One is the Great Hall, which is a splendid historic uh, building. And then we have the barn for, I suppose, the lesser-known authors... So, Michael, tell me about yours, because yours is, is a newbie. You're in the four, fourth year, is that right? Absolutely, yes. August, is it? August, yes. It started without design, actually. I had been living and working in Russia. I was a partner in a big global law firm, and I spent months riding home, as I no longer wanted to be a partner in a law firm, but I didn't know what I did want to be. Anyway, I got back to Britain to great celebrations with lots of friends and family and then found myself unemployed because I'd left my job. Yes. So I was exactly in the void that I had intended to create, but it was a little bit uh, uncomfortable. So I was spending time in a village in Pembrokeshire, Langham. Now I have to ask you before you go any further, the pronunciation, because I read about this before we met and that was not how I would have imagined it would be pronounced. Yes, it's spelt with the double L-A-N, so it's, it would be pronounced typically in Welsh as llan, and that means place. But the village itself has Flemish recent Flemish origin. So in the village, they call it Langham. It used to be a fishing community and had a wonderful population of herring living in the Clethai estuary, which goes deep from the Priscelli Mountains out to Milford Haven. And there used to be this very old type of salmon fishing as well in in coracles, but that's pretty much at the end. And that rural economic deprivation played into why you set the festival up, didn't it? Yes, well, I think when there is very little in a place that you that you live in, you have to do things yourself. And I must admit, when I moved to the village, I was very much struck by the creativity of the village. There were lots of artists and people writing. And then one very, very hungover day after New Year, I was with a friend in a pub and ran into another friend of mine, Harry Mount. He's the editor of The Oldie, and he's written quite a good number of books and I mentioned to him that I was thinking of occupying myself with setting up a festival and and he said well count me in I will come oh great and and a friend of his David Horsepool who's the history editor for the TLS will come as well so with those and with writers in the village who were not known but had written some very interesting books I stuck my neck out and thought well let's let's try so that was a great start there's always a point isn't there in these enterprises where you you have the great idea and you talk about it and then suddenly you have to go public and commit to doing it yes and it's quite scary it's very very scary and I, i must say i lost a huge amount of sleep during the first year before we started and i took to underwrite the festival myself, which was a little bit reckless given I didn't have a job at the time. Uh, and a week before we started, we were a £1,000 down, but, but we it's finished the first year with £700 up. When we um, started Slightly Foxed, I bought a book on the subject of starting a business. It was full of completely useless information about starting your own hairdressing business or window cleaning or what have you, but the single thing that actually was worth the cover price was the final piece of information, which was... What's stopping you? Fear of failure. Once you get over that, you're fine. Yes, it's true. And we were also very, very lucky because Griff Rees jones and I know he's just had an OBE, and I was, I was absolutely delighted because he came to our festival in the first year, and I just invited him thinking maybe he will, maybe he won't. And he did. And he did, and he returned the cheque. Oh, wonderful. Oh, that's very delightful. So, yes. I mean, you do sound it went very well indeed from a standing start. It did, but I was told right from the very start, not being of the village myself, that 
it was very important to include all of the stakeholders in the village. So that means including the farmers who kindly provide fields that we can park in, including there are two chapels and a church, and, and the Methodist chapel actually said, well, we will open and we will exhibit art in part of the chapel and we'll serve bacon rolls in the other part of the chapel. A nice mix. A nice mix. But we had a little bit of a fracas before we started because they were terrified that they wouldn't make any money because Matthew, who runs the pub, was also serving bacon rolls in the marquee. And that's an indication of of the thin layer of visitors that you get in that part of the world. Because as it happens, once the festival started, the chapel ran out of bacon rolls on, at the end of the first day, had to go and get more, and they made so much money that they gave some of it to charity at the end. I mean, what did the villagers, the local people, think? Because it's classic, isn't it? Incomer comes in with this bright, shiny idea and starts telling everyone how to do things. I mean, yes. Did it go down well? It did. I mean, it was odd, really, because I had spent all this time in, in Russia and foolishly moved to the village with a sand-coloured, sporty Range Rover, um, uh-huh. which could also be described, <laughs> as, a, also could be described <laughs> as a gold-coloured Range Rover. So for a long time in the village pub, I was known as the Russian. And, <laughs> I thought he was uh, a oligarch. Yes. Also, I had been in the Territorial Army, and when I went running, sometimes would wear my sports gear with army motifs so I was either the Russian or the spy (laughs) but it it, actually the village I could not have done it without the village and you've been tipped as one of I was looking Mm. up the best literary festivals for 2019 obviously ways with words was in there I think they had a list of 10 and it was either the FT or the Guardian one of those and Languin was in there gosh actually we're very picky and and I think writers find it a bit surprising sometimes that they they write and say can we be in your festival I always say to them well please send a copy of the book and we'll give it to our review team and and if you're if you're <laughs> and the review team is made up of people in the village because if you don't have people in the village supporting you then then forget it yeah, yeah. That's so sensible mm. because very often the best writers are quite shy and retiring and the ones who tend to put themselves forward a lot are perhaps not quite as talented sharp so. elbowed but yeah. yeah exactly yes so and you know listening to that it strikes me the challenges for you at dartington i mean there are some parallels but it's entirely different is it more about because you're such a long-standing well-known festival about keeping it fresh and reinventing it Yes, Dartington has been going for 28 years. We now have a number of other festivals going on during the year, not at exactly the same time as us in the locale. And it would be fair to say that because we're a 10-day festival and we don't take place during school holidays, it's quite tricky making sure we attract some children and some young adults. Yes, I was going to ask you about that, because all festivals, actually, and there's the literary festivals, and you look at the pictures, a lot of grey heads. I mean, nothing wrong with yes, that. Because, but, you know, yes, grey heads have got, got the time on their hands and also the money. One way, one thing we do is we offer bursaries for um, 25 students at Dartington, between 17 and 24, they have to be aged, and they get the opportunity to interview writers on their own for their own little podcasts and so forth. We also do a word circus a couple of days at the weekends, and that's targeting children with interesting literary ideas and, and creativity with literature. And we were talking about this before we started recording, the proliferation, you say 350 festivals, I think, in the, in the UK now, literary festivals now. Why do people go, do you all think? Well, I think that people love going to events. And when you go to a literary festival, you feel you're doing something cultural as well. Yes. And also a lot of them take place in the summer. And they're often in very be- both Dartington and Langham are both in really beautiful places. So people go on holiday and then maybe they'll spend a couple of days at the festivals. I mean, although they're called literary festivals, obviously a lot of the authors are actually non-fiction writers. So you can go and hear people talking about current affairs in China or, you know, much more practical, a cookery writer, for example. So educational. So educational in that sense, I think, yes. We at uh, Ways with Words, we do invite a number of well-known authors, of course, because, frankly, that pulls people in. A number of, I think, audiences, they like to see the, the writer in the flesh and they also like the opportunity to engage with them either with questioning or in the book signings and so forth. So I think, you know, I think there's a little bit of hero worship that that can go on. But we also have probably two thirds of our authors 
are less well known. And so someone will come along, buy a ticket for somebody they know, Marcus de Sotoy, for example. And then the same day, they'll think, right, there's this going on in the other venue. And that's all about Cherry Blossom. Fabulous book, actually, on Cherry Blossom. And we'll go and listen to that. And so it broadens their reading scope. I think you have some crossover events as well, don't you? By which I mean you have some comedians, sometimes singers, and then Um, you're bringing in a new audience as well, aren't you? Yes, exactly. I mean, presumably industrial quantities of planning goes into these events. When do you start? Yeah, it's actually a, a treadmill, really. Because there are three festivals through the year, the administrators are already planning for the Southwold Festival in November whilst they're just about to put on the Dartington Festival. So it's it's massive. And do you ship them round your three festivals? I mean, do you have some crossover? We do have quite a lot of crossover. If somebody goes down well, then obviously we're trying to get them for the next one. If we think something's worth pursuing, it might not necessarily yet get the audiences, but if we think that there's something there. An example would be Raina Wynne, who comes from the South West, and she's written a book about uh, walking the South West coast with her husband. That's um, the front door, if you're wondering what the hell is this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, who is terminally ill. It's a very um, moving and stirring book. Went down a treat in Cumbria, and so obviously we invite her again to come to one or two of the other two festivals. Do you pay the speakers? We do, and um, we're a non-profit festival. And it's all volunteers on your team, It's all isn't it? volunteers. So we have a committee who work really hard throughout the year. We start planning in the autumn for the following August. So it was really important to us to pay, understanding that for a lot of writers, life is quite lonely, quite isolating, and without a lot of income, I think. Yes, very few writers actually live off their writing. I'm, a, I'm a right? Yeah. 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 I mean, in a sense, our economic model is a bit strange because we are deliberately cheap. We have small venues. Our biggest venue is 200. And it's always an idea that a writer is going to say, well, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to come if if the maximum audience is 200. But the fee we pay is as much as I understand other festivals pay. And our audience does buy books. Dartington in the past, or Ways With Words in the past, used to cosset the writers instead of paying them. They were put up in lovely places and, and looked after. And it's so beautiful. In beautiful surroundings. Yeah. And in fact, we've got you know, stories of people like Clive James going down to the River Dart late at night with Andrew Marr and bathing in the river, possibly fueled with a little alcohol. I don't know. And skinny dipping. Skinny dipping. Well, the rumour has it. Um, and you can imagine, actually, that you just mentioned the isolation of writers. So getting together and actually exchanging ideas over supper is something they clearly love. And I've witnessed it and you get some extraordinary conversations however Philip Pullman a few years ago made a stand really for writers being paid and since then I've noted a sea change in as much as that writers especially those who are not yet selling books by the the yard yeah Yeah, exactly for them it's you know one two days of work given up so we have started to pay interesting as well as still entertaining them I think quite well is hay still the big one I would say Hay is the big one. (laughs) There are others, though, aren't there? Cheltenham and Edinburgh and so on. So for people who don't know the Hay Festival... It's amazing. I was lucky enough to grow up very close to Hay, and I have to say that quite a lot of Hay was the inspiration for Langham, because I remember Hay when it was very small, where you could have Clinton. I mean, I remember meeting Clinton. It was after the Levinsky scandal, and my father, who's a died in the wall Welshman, was saying, I'm not sure whether I'd want to shake his hand. But in <laughs> fact, he did when Clinton was doing a walkabout. And of course, his security people were there, but it was magical. And what Peter Florence has done for Hay and actually for Britain in showing what can be done in what was in the 60s a very small town and in a town that would probably be dying. This is Hay on Wye, Hay on Wye. It's in Wales, but it's right on the Welsh borders in a very beautiful area. A town of bookshops. A town of bookshops. And it still has, and obviously the festival has meant that all those bookshops can stay open. I mean, that the festival presumably is the local economy now, isn't it? It's so huge. It's important to remember there's still farming and, and fishing and tourism. But the in spend those of people who come. I mean, people come from all yeah. over the world to Hay, don't and they? And they have too. They have the winter weekend as well, which for those people who want to remember what Hay was like beforehand, go to the Winter Festival, which is small, and it's in the town. It was Hay, actually, which first switched me on to literary festivals, I have to say. And I, I went year after year. And the diversity, the sheer diversity at Hay um, and... 
I have to say, though, that for me, the glory days were when it was a little bit smaller. You were rubbing shoulders with the authors, and I can remember standing next door to Kashi Ishiguro and thinking, oh, my goodness. You should come to us because the maximum size is 200. Mm. So we pride ourselves on the fact that anyone who wants to ask a question will be able to ask the question. There's yeah. an intimacy, isn't there, about those smaller occasions and events? You were asking why do people go to literary festivals. I think it's also important to understand why people don't go. I remember going around in our first year thinking, oh, we're going to lose money, and going into every shop and cafe in Haverford West and handing out a leaflet, and people would say, you know, what's a literacy festival? And <laughs> having to explain it, but then also getting people to understand it is for them. Just because you've got an amazing writer or academic, they're not out of reach. You can stand by them, ask them questions. Yeah, it's pretty special, isn't it? The, the festival it's experience. Community, and that's what both of your festivals share. They're in one space. There are a lot of communal areas where people can eat together. And when I've been to festivals, you know, I quite often bump into the same people going from event to event and you get chatting and, and it, it's lovely. It's a real... Yes, one of the most exciting things for us is end of the first event, out pour the people and the buzz. You know, they may be arguing about what they've just heard. Uh, if you've got someone like Polly Toynbee, for example, she stirs them up. But they're, they're talking and the ideas are flowing. It's really, really exciting. And for all those that put all the hard work in beforehand... That's a pleasure, isn't it? It is. It is. And it, it also comes back to the idea why people go to festivals. Well, there's a, a writer, Jules Evans, who wrote about, it's called Ecstasy and the Art of Losing Control. And so he examines all sorts of festivals and dervishes and all the sorts of things that pull people together. And it's exactly what Anne was saying, really. People go and share something together. So if they run into each other, they will have something to talk about, a bond between them. There's two things I want to ask about. One of them is weather, the terror of rain. Oh, Anne's nodding. And the other thing is food, so don't let me forget to ask you, but tell me about weather. Oh, actually, it's not weather. It's trains. Ah. One year, there was, just when we were about to get the festival going, there was a 24-hour train and tube strike. This affected 28 writers. Oh. And so there were 28 events at risk. So the most extraordinary last-minute travel arrangements were come to where people were car sharing interesting combinations of authors as well <laughs> car sharing and so forth we ended up only having to sacrifice two events which i think is quite yeah, good going good go, yeah. yes weather but weather can have its good point weather in <laughs> west wales can be very extreme last year our green room blew away during the night during <laughs> during a storm and we were expecting the bishop of st david's but she was very understanding, as, as you would expect. Everyone else was understanding. And yeah, I mean, Pembrokeshire's got great beaches. If it's warm and sunny, why wouldn't you go to the most beautiful beaches in Britain? So we like it when it's a little bit cooler. Now, on the food front, you mentioned bacon sandwiches earlier, but I mean, it's a big part of your motivation that you're bringing money into the area, and that involves people spending money on, with local pubs and food providers. Absolutely. And the yeah. pub's really got on board with it, hasn't it? Yes, we're extremely lucky that the landlord of the pub is up for anything. So he is this year, in honour of Lady Carnarvon's visit, he's turning the cottage in into Downton Abbey. In fact, there's a local gin producer, the Clevi gin company and they're giving a bottle of gin to the best lady grantham because it will be fancy dress but the whole menu for the evening people will are be dressing up as people are dressing lady up grantham. so the story on the ground is that haverford west has sold out of ostrich feathers and pearls <laughs> Um, we want pictures for the website. Yeah, we'll I definitely, think. <laughs> definitely get pictures. But they, I mean, it just brings a lot of synergies. When we did the centenary of the Russian Revolution, we found a, a Welsh vodka producer, Penderin, that normally does does whiskey, but they'd brought out a premium vodka, so they gave us a case of premium vodka and for our poems and pints session at the rugby club. And it was it was amazing because we had the most amazing poetry that people were reading from Bloch, Kachmatova talking about what life was like in the Soviet Union or even at the time of the, the civil war in Russia, fueled with Welsh vodka. So it was very good. A couple of years ago, I interviewed Adam Kay, he of This Is Going To Hurt, um, really before the book had taken off in the extraordinary way it's now taken off. And the audience were absolutely wrapped and engaged by Alan, Adam Cave. But at the end, at the book signing, I stood beside and various people were coming up and telling him stories, some of which were really, really tragic. And his actual 
art of listening to each one of those was really, for me, a moment when I thought, yes, this is someone who hasn't yet got taken over by his own um, success. Or his PR team. Sorry, Steph, but, you know, the big kind of <laughs> being man, the managed experience of being a writer doing a signing. Yeah, exactly. And he was just giving his all. Um, and I just thought, wow, this is literary festivals at their very best. You can't I think beat it's it. the surprise elements of sometimes finding authors. When yes. I went to Hay, we'd booked to see Rose Tremaine. She was ill on the day. And I went to see Janina Ramirez talk about Julian of Norwich. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be an event that would have jumped out at me, but it was fantastic. I went off and bought the book and then I've actually bought the book for several other people because it was such a fantastic little biography. And you get spontaneous things happening, like David Crystal, the, the guru of English language, taking a group of students out onto the lawns at um, Dartington and giving them effectively a, a free seminar. <laughs> They'll never forget David Crystal and what they learnt that day. Absolutely. Just to remind, before we wrap this up, just remind us of your events. We're always in the second weekend of August. And Anne? Well, the next event will be Southwold in November, November the 7th to the 11th. We're going to move on now to um, entirely different and rather more urban territory with our extract from the slightly foxed back catalogue. Um, Gail, tell us, tell us what we're going to hear. Um, well, it's a rather glorious piece about a literary festival where one of our contributors was um, asked to stand in on a speed dating exercise and basically the idea was that you became an author and people came along to see whether or not they liked you and he chose to be Iris Murdoch. Some years ago a couple of friends were running a speed dating event at the Cheltenham Festival of Literature and asked if I could help out. So it was that I found myself meeting 20 women for very short periods of time wearing nothing, as it were, but a name tag. Because it was a literature festival, however, our name tags didn't sport our own names. Instead, they carried the title of a favourite book or author or character. That evening, I wore Iris Murdoch on my lapel. As a result, every time I changed tables, I was greeted by one of two opening gambits. On the one hand, the words, the sea, the sea, might be said, an acknowledgement of her book or winning novel, usually followed by, I've not read it. Or I would be encouraged to agree that Jim Broadbent is a really superb actor, especially in the film Iris. It's not unusual for an author to be remembered for such things, but it seems a bit of a shame, as does a third response, voiced by many of my speed daters. I've always found her rather impenetrable. Perhaps Iris Murdoch is often seen as off-putting because she began her career as a philosopher and she lectured in and published books on the subject. Her books inhabit a world alive with philosophical thinking. Her characters are people in search of meaning and understanding on the deepest levels. In short, they worry a lot. What sometimes isn't mentioned is that all her books are also rollicking love stories. Her characters fall in and out of love passionately, desperately, often with the wrong people, often inopportunely. And it's these two poles that make her books entirely their own creatures. Stories of intellectuals having affairs with one another and worrying about the nature of the good. And they're funny too, and heartbreaking. They're like grandiose Shakespearean tragedies and comedies with added vigour and philosophy. Take her novel, The Sea, The Sea. It's told in the first person by a retired theatre director, Charles Araby, who moves to a remote cottage on the coast. He's busy living a life of solitude and simplicity, a break from his London life, when he meets a woman in the local small town. She turns out to have been the love of his life, whom he last saw 40 years ago. They have both grown old, but in his deluded loins the fires are relit. She is married, he stalks her, abducts her, all sorts of complicated, embarrassing and frankly frightening things happen and eventually she is lost to him again. So much for the plot. We only have the report by Araby himself, however, and as a storyteller he is astonishingly self-centred, self-important and clearly somewhat deluded. One wonders exactly how far the unreliability of his unreliable narration extends. What would this story of obsessive, destructive, unrequited love of one pensioner for another look like from the outside? The Black Prince, an earlier first-person novel, actually has four additional postscripts written by other characters. 
each of whom shares their view of the narrator and each of whom puts themselves at the centre as the real undeclared love interest of the story. Maybe that's an accurate way of seeing things. To assume such a central importance is certainly very funny to read, but in The Sea, The Sea, Araby goes wonderfully above and beyond, entirely unable to imagine any other point of view. This is where Murdoch's prose comes into its own, delighting in its own fecundity, believing in richness rather than sparseness. She piles detail upon detail without ever losing her grip on the story. Her writing is sometimes criticised for the fact that her characters live their lives in closed circles outside the real world. No one ever seems to own a television, go to the cinema or read a paper. In fact, news events never seem to intrude. If they have jobs, then they're usually civil servants who never seem to go to the office. There is a lot of truth in these comments. Iris Murdoch's characters aren't always connected to the real world, aren't always anchored in a recognisable time, but they're Shakespearean in that way. The real world, the one outside these strange, closed-away communities, in the sea, the sea, it's an isolated cottage, in the bell, it's a nunnery, has nothing to do with the story and so is unnecessary. This is what love does. It drives away all other concerns. Her novels often dwell in that middle section of A Midsummer Night's Dream, where all is magic and bewildering in love. Even at their most fantastical, most unlikely and bizarre, Murdoch's novels are desperately true and beautiful. But I couldn't say all this in the four minutes I had to share with each of those women in Cheltenham, and so I left empty-handed, except for my name badge, which had declared me to be Iris Murdoch for just one night. Dear, I love that. I love that synopsis of the sea, the sea, the unrequited love of one pensioner for another. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I listened to it on the radio, actually. There, Did was, you? A, there was one summer it was serialised on the radio. I find it horribly depressing. I and, do too. But I mean, I think it's amazing how well she writes about the character of a man not being a man yes. herself. But it's, yeah. it's grim though, isn't it? It is a bit grim. Yeah, yeah. Bit Under the net is such fun. Has anyone ever been speed dating? I'm just curious, really. It's not relevant. No, but I was in a, in a cafe in Beijing, a bookworm cafe, and they started closing off one part of it and did ask me if I wanted to join their, their, their speed dating. <laughs> but, but I had to catch my flight. So. That's your yeah. excuse. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I know a couple who got married having met speed dating, but I suspect they may be the only ones. Uh, that was from AF Harold's piece about Iris Murdoch from issue 25. It was voiced for us by the writer and voice artist Chris Neal. Uh, book recommendations from everyone shortly. First, a word about Slightly Foxed. Elegant and entertaining, Slightly Foxed is the literary quarterly for non-conformists. It introduces readers to all those wonderful books that languish on publishers' backlists but disappear from bookshops. Its contributors are established writers, journalists and people from many fields. They all share their passion for particular books and authors. And since it's entirely independent, Slightly Fox is free to follow its own nose and celebrate the offbeat. So why not take out a subscription? Happily, it's a bargain. £48 for a year's print subscription and free access to all the back issues in the digital archive. Here's the web address, foxedquarterly.com. Or if you'd rather talk to a human, give Hattie a call. She's on 020 7033 0258. Thank you. Okay, book recommendations, uh, ideally from off the beaten track, but don't have to be. Anne? Well, mine isn't off the beaten track. I thought I'd choose a book that I've read recently. And that's Take Nothing With You by Patrick Gale. I came to Patrick Gale quite late, I think. He's since um, found, found a claim um, with receiving an Emmy Award for his uh, televised Man in an Orange Shirt. But he's a sort of popular writer, really, and not seen as part of the English canon by any means. I think he's a superb writer, actually. It's a page-turner. He tends to write by his own admission autobiographically, but he goes out from his own biography to expand into fiction. And this book, Take Nothing With You, is essentially the story of a middle-aged man who's having a cancer treatment and is isolated for up to 48 hours, I suppose, and it's a time for reflection upon his youth. So it becomes a sort of of coming-of-age book in a way. 
And you can see Patrick's interests coming through, music in particular. And in this book, music is seen as a, a restorative, a protective, a healing feature that the, the young man, Eustace, the young boy, Eustace, really leans on, I suppose, as he deals with the dysfunctional parents he has, as he comes to terms with being gay and an adolescent, what that means for him in the future. I love novels that don't just entertain but also inform you in some way and for me Patrick does Patrick Girls books do that every time the only thing I'd say is he possibly told me a little bit too much about the thumb position on the cello but that's about (laughs) that's about my only criticism of a book I just found very entertaining that's great Gail yes I'm in the middle of a wonderful book by David Gilmore called The British in India and it is a a magisterial account of 300 years of experience by all sorts of people who went out to India for all sorts of different reasons, military men and administrators, judges and medical missionaries, indigo planters and tea planters, and the list goes on. He has spent years researching this, and it is absolutely full of the most extraordinary stories. But what strikes me about it particularly is this brings home to you how the motives were so varied. So often people were the victims of their own particular circumstances. One might not necessarily think so now, but they genuinely believed that they were in some way or other doing good. I was very moved by it. Well, I haven't finished it yet, but um, I do recommend it. Steph? Well, like Anne, I've chosen a fairly recent book. I've just finished Pat Barker's The Silence of the Girls. It was utterly brilliant. (laughs) It's a reimagining of Homer's Iliad, seen through the eyes of Briseis. She is a Trojan queen who is taken when the Greeks sack the city that she and her family live in. All the men are killed, all the women and some of the children are taken as slaves. She's very beautiful. She is given to Achilles as his concubine. Agamemnon stole Briseis from Achilles and thereby began another very brutal war within the Greek camp, let alone between the Trojans and the Greeks. So the conflict rolls forward. Conflict rolls forward and it is... Don't tell us what happens at the end. Okay, okay, okay. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. So, Michael. I have one and it's also... Related to the Indian subcontinent, it's about Pakistan, and it's by the beautifully named Isambard Wilkinson, and it travels in a dervish cloak. Isambard, or Bard, he was the telegraph correspondent to Pakistan, and it's about his life there and about the people that he met. He captures the characters beautifully, and also the language, the slightly archaic, clipped English that is spoken in that part of the world. And then he travels out to some of the tribal areas in Baluchistan, Luchistan and meets various Nawab, so it's particularly the Nawab Bukti, and he describes these fascinating people who were very controversial characters, really, in, in Pakistan, and Nawab Bukti has now been killed. He gives you a window on a really misunderstood world, talks about these festivals as well, where the air is full of the scent of hashish, but also full of the frenzy of Sufism. It's, it's full of contrast. It's not a particularly long book, but you finish it understanding Pakistan much better with all its diversity and colours than you understood at the start. We have eaten up our time for this episode. Thanks again to Michael Pugh and Anne Oxborough. Thank you very much for having us. Yes, thank you. You can find, obviously, all the details of the um, books and the writers and events that we've mentioned today in the show notes attached to this episode on your podcast app. All that information also on the website, foxquarterly.com, which I would thoroughly recommend visiting. There's all sorts of fascinating bookish things on there. And the application form. If you feel you've come to know us well enough to buy an annual subscription to the quarterly magazine itself. We'll be back on September 15th when we'll have the first of an occasional series on writing about place. For this first one, we'll be exploring Orkney and one of the great Scottish poet novelists of the 20th century, George Mackay Brown, a fascinating character who may be new to you. We hope you can be with us again for that. And thanks for joining us on this month's Literary Expedition. <laughs>